This is not a time-sharing system. That's right. In fact, it's very different from a time-sharing system. Uh, as anyone who's ever used a time-sharing system knows, they get very, very slow when lots of people want to use them. They've also become quite econ uneconomical with all the new chip technology. So what we have here is a lot of individual use machines, which means when you're working, you're working on the machine and you're the only one using it. Now, lots of what we call personal computers are things that you have at home on your desk, and that's it. Ordinarily, it doesn't communicate with any other machine, and that's also not what we're talking about here. There's a great deal of effort being put into wiring the whole campus so that although the cycles, the processing power, are in your own machine on your desk, you can get file access from a general file um, storage service. And what that means is that if I'm a professor, and I have a program and I suddenly want to update it, make it a little different, I simply change that file once and my students with their own machines all over the campus have that single updated file. Uh, we are shooting for a workstation that we can sell uh, to our faculty and students uh, as individuals for about $3,000. Now, basically you're talking a machine for a workstation that for the same cost as your standard business personal computer or home computer these days, it's about 10 to 20 times more powerful. That's exactly right. If not more. Yes. Do you think they can do it? I think, I know they can do it. When the network's in place and Andrew's up and all the workstations are in, how many computers are there actually going to be on campus? Uh, we will have five to 7,000 of these advanced function workstations. Students are already encouraged to own their own micros and the university's computer shop is doing a roaring trade in today's technology, largely selling hardware and software for a range of incompatible machines. The university wants to be able to run any software on any workstation built to their specifications by any manufacturer. Is this pipe dream likely to come true? I don't know. That's, um, that's really a question for the next 10 years. It is certainly impossible with machines smaller than the ones we're talking about. If we talk about 8 or 16-bit machines, app, in this country, Apples, IBM PCs, Macintoshes, uh, the, there is no question about it. The hardware intrudes on the programming always. You have to know what kind of display device you've got, how much memory you've got, etc., etc., what sort of operating system you have. When you get a more powerful machine, you can use part of that power to provide some insulation, kind of a buffer, so that the machine says, yeah, I've got this kind of hardware, but I want to talk to the user in this way. And a very similar system can say, well, I've got a different kind of hardware, but I want to talk to the user in this way. If that's done well, and if it's done consistently, there's at least a possibility of, of what you've heard we're trying to do here, which is to have if not machine-independent software, at least software that can go with some ease from machine to machine. Meanwhile, software is being written for today's machines. This student took months to develop a program that plots the electrical field around metal objects. So an example of a thing a person can do with this program is to come over here and select graph, draw a line between two points, specify a number of points to be evaluated along that line. The program will step through and evaluate the potential along the line, and then will produce a plot of the potential as a function of position. So the student can experiment with lines, the nature of the potential variation along those lines, and the relationship of that kind of description to a plot of equal potential lines. This software was developed for this room full of Hewlett Packards you've got here. Right. What's involved in adapting it so it will run on the Andrew system when it's, it's finished? Uh, we're not sure. Um, we think it'll probably take a month or so's effort this summer to at least get a, an elementary version of it up and running on Andrew. We pay those students during the summer to do software programming for us. Obviously, this software is of great value to this university and is potentially saleable to other schools around the world. Is there any controversy about who owns it? Certainly a student who's been involved in developing software like this has some part of the rights to that software. And the question is, how much of the rights belong to the university, how much belong to the individuals? The new network is inspiring many on the campus. In the music department, Roger Dannenberg has ambitious plans for the advanced workstation. 
Well, that was Round Midnight by Thelonious Monk. I was playing trumpet, and my computer was playing an accompanying bass line. The computer was actually listening to what I was playing, and by comparing what I played to what was stored in the computer for the melody of Round Midnight, it was able to speed up and slow down with me and play the corresponding bass line. What we've just done is very interesting, but how's it going to fit into the, uh, the CMU net when it's all together? Well, this is probably going to be just one component of uh, a much larger system called the Musician's Workbench. The Musician's Workbench is a, will be a collection of programs for manipulating musical information, uh, dealing with performance, allowing composers to compose music and orchestrators to orchestrate music. And this is all being uh, constructed on top of the uh, CMU workstation and the Andrew software system. So from any workstation on campus, I could call up your musical programs and use them for my composing and scoring and orchestrating, just as if I were calling up word processing or electronic mail or one of the more standard packages. That's right. You can think of our the basic level of our software as being something like a word processor for music. You've got something connected to an English synthesizer, I understand. That's right. We're using the Bradford Musical Instrument Simulator that was designed and uh, first constructed by Peter Comerford at the University of Bradford. I think eventually we'll have one of these on every musician uh, personal computer. Impressive. Now let's, let's hear this. Huge sums are going into the development of computer networks here at CMU. Much of that money is coming from the computer industry. Clearly, both sides see the potential for enormous payoffs. But what are they? People in universities, professors and administrators in other universities, are, are very interested in the question of teaching and learning. People in corporations are interested in the question of what will students today who will be the employees of tomorrow expect by way of a computing environment. Um, what will they know how to do? What kinds of technology will they want in order to do the, the kinds of jobs that they've been trained to do? And obviously vendor developers and vendors of computing hardware and software are watching to see the kinds of developments that we are able to produce here. So I think many people in the world are watching for, for many different reasons. And watching from a great distance are the British universities. This is the University of Salford, a technological university similar in size to Carnegie Mellon. However, like other British universities, Salford is facing hard times. Just a few years ago, its grant was cut by 40%. So how relevant is the CMU experiment? John Ashworth is the Vice-Chancellor of Salford. Oh, well, the, the experiment's great. I mean, it's, it's, it's the American system at its best, exactly what you would expect them to do. Set up an experiment, throw money at it, and, and accept that much of it's going to be wasted. Uh, in the UK, we've never quite gone about our business like that, even in the heyday, and in the universities, um, we are very, very short of money. So um, I have to say that it's inconceivable for us to do anything like that. So we need an IBM. Well, we, we need a godfather <clears throat> uh, or a government to give us the money, and at the moment we've got neither. Of course, IBM aren't being altogether altruistic about this, are they? In the oh, States? no. I mean, <laughs> the, the, it, it, it's fact, it was very clear, I think, from the program that you filmed that there is still a lot to learn, and IBM very much want to know uh, some of the lessons that are going to come from Carnegie Mellon and, to be fair, other universities which are collaborating with, with other suppliers, and that's why they're doing experiments. I mean, they need a test bed, they need a demonstration centre. It's a good time to sit back, let them make the mistakes, and save ourselves a lot of money. Well, I think it's a, oh, oh, I'd love to do the experiment, of course. I mean, you know, I wish, I, I, I wish somebody would, uh, would give the University of Salford that kind of money. What we have been given is enough money to begin to make uh, some of the mistakes and learn some of the lessons, which are, I think, the really important ones. Now, it's, this is not to establish the technology, to work out how you make an IBM PC communicate with an Apple Macintosh or whether it's Unix or whatever. I mean, all that's the sort of technological problem. The, the educationally interesting problems are what you use the machine for and how do you present different kinds of educational task or training uh, uh, requirement to the student through this medium. Assuming a satisfactory outcome to the CMU experiment, 
How are computers going to affect the quality of our education? Let me say that the, in, in many ways, although it was tremendously exciting, all that technology at, at, at Carnegie Mellon, and immensely beguiling, um, there is a danger, and the danger that it's at is that it's actually too beguiling. I mean, you get so hung up with the technology, so intrigued by Andrew or Roger or whatever it is you want to call it, that you forget that it's actually a means to an end and not an end in itself. And the, the, the end is better education. Uh, I think the real act of faith, which you can see being tested in America, is that computers will enable us not only to give what we do presently better, but actually do new things. The, the, the act of faith is that there are skills which society needs, which these machines require and elicit from us, and which they themselves are um, the training agents. And if that's true, then who can say what kind of society that will give rise to? What do you think of art students having to learn high-level languages like Lisp? It seems to me perfectly natural, because the, the problem uh, of using uh, computers for educational purposes is not a technological one, in essence. It, it's a linguistic one. I mean, you're talking to a machine and using a machine to help you communicate uh, as opposed to talking to a person or using a translator to help you to communicate with somebody who speaks another language. So I see that Lisp and Prolog are languages like Chinese or French or, or, or Spanish. And uh, it seems to be obvious, in fact, that the people who are most pre-adapted, if you like, to some of these activities will be art students. Let's move on to something else, sir. You mentioned that the government was being slightly mean there. Now, the government has claimed to be putting information technology very high on its list of priorities. Are they, in fact, ducking their responsibilities? Yes, I believe they are. I mean, I think that we have a clear skill shortage. They accept that. Uh, they've decided to spend £43 million pounds in increasing the provision at the university, predominantly at the university level, for uh, graduates and so on. But in fact, that £43 million pounds has come from other parts of the budget. So it's not, not, as far as the universities are concerned, new money. And, but even worse than that, they're not using that, that £43 million pounds in an experimental way. They're merely using it to replicate what we already do. Looking ahead a few years now, what will be the consequences of that lack of investment? We will not have the skilled people we need. Our service industries will find that they do not have access to the technologies they need. And by that I mean the banks and the financial system, the, the city. The city is already finding that it's having a great deal of difficulty recruiting the computer specialists it needs. And uh, at least at the moment, we are, according to the government, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, going to become a service-driven economy. Well, we're going to become an unproductive, non-technologically-based service-driven economy, and that means a poor economy. So we're talking about a great deal more than just education here. Oh, yes, as always. I and mean, as the Americans uh, say, I mean, if you think education is, is expensive, uh, just try the alternative. Professor John Ashworth. And finally, from universities to the news that the British electronic publishing company, Datasolve, has signed an agreement with the Soviet news agency, TASS, to distribute its stories to terminals around the world. The signing on Tuesday in London is the first time the Soviets have ever consented to have their news distributed from a database. It means that from now on, subscribers to Datasolve will have rapid access to any TASS report, using Datasolve's ability to search for any particular word or subject. In our next programme, we'll be looking at Prestel, and asking whatever happened to the promise of armchair access to mass information. Eight years after its launch, it still only has about 60,000 members, and most of them are in business. Its critics say it's old technology poorly promoted. Next week, we discover why some of those promises have not been met, and ask, have the French been leapfrogging ahead? Until next week, goodbye. <laughs>